Hello and welcome. My name is Raj Basord. I'm a consultant psychiatrist based in London. With Scott Samuelson. Scott teaches philosophy at Kirkwood Community College in the USA, in uh, Iowa. And he's written uh, a book, just been published um, by um, Chicago. And the book is entitled uh, The Deepest Human Life. And the subtitle is An Introduction to Philosophy for Everyone. And this is published by the University of Chicago Press. Now, Scott's main thesis um, in this book seems to be that philosophy, which is usually regarded as a fairly obscure, dry, slightly aloof, remote subject, actually has real practical relevance to everyday life. And indeed, you're not going to be able to lead your life or live your life properly without understanding um, a bit of philosophy. The book is uh, a riveting read. It reads like a gripping novel. And I want to start, Scott, by asking you to defend this position that you start off with, which is this idea that philosophy is of practical, everyday use to everyone and anyone. Yeah, well, thanks, first of all, for having me on. And I think you have hit the nail on the head with what I really am trying to get across to people, that philosophy is uh, practical in some sense. Um, and I think philosophy has any number of things that make it valuable. But let me just focus on a couple that I think are absolutely crucial. Um, first of all, I don't think that anyone can kind of get through life. In fact, I don't even think you can make it to the age of seven without having already asked yourself some pretty serious philosophical questions. One of the things that I'm always kind of gratified by, and I remember myself being in this position, is that students come into my class and after we've talked about various kinds of things, they'll come up to me afterwards and they say, oh my god, I've always been having these kinds of thoughts. I just didn't know anyone really ever talked about them. So it, it dignifies a certain kind of set of concerns in us. Um, but maybe more to the point about why it's so valuable, I don't know if I completely agree with Socrates when he says that the unexamined life is not worth living, but I certainly agree uh, with the idea that the examined life is much preferable to the unexamined life. That, I mean, at best case scenario, if you're leading an unexamined life, um, uh, you, you know, you've got good relationships, a good job, you're, you're doing more or less what you should be doing, but if you were to examine those things, you would see their value in a deeper way. But that's only the best case scenario. I think oftentimes when we seriously examine our lives, we do find the ways in which they come up short at times, or the ways in which the identities we bought into are uh, 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 less than ideal. So, you know, I think that that kind of philosophy sort of jump starts or helps uh, with that examination process. So. In, in that sense, I really think that you know to lead a really full life, you have to have some philosophy. That doesn't necessarily mean that you have to spend all your time reading Leibniz, but but it means that you have to actually engage in the real work of of thinking and reflecting on your life. And I do think that the tradition of philosophy can be helpful there. One of the other things that your book does, and, it, and it's full of stories about these students that you teach, and these students are very ordinary people holding down very ordinary jobs. They're plumbers, they're nurses. Um, but they're not people who are um, university academics or have been to the most prestigious universities and hold a series of degrees. And yet the, the book is full of these interactions you're having with them where they pose dilemmas, quandaries, questions in their, in their everyday lives which you feel philosophy has something to bring. So you're also trying to argue, I think, in the book that you don't have to be some kind of super intellectual or super academic to get into philosophy. No, not at all. That's you're exactly right. That that um, you do not need to be some super intellectual. Um, and and in fact, I, I'm quite committed to the idea that philosophy is valuable to to all of us. Now, I admit that occasionally there are people who are you know not inclined at all to philosophy. The curious thing is is that I found that some of them have ended up getting jobs teaching philosophy. But um, <laughs> but I do think that. Uh, um, you know, it, it's it's a it's a pretty deep prejudice to believe that philosophy is valuable for doctors, but not for nurses, or is valuable for uh, uh, you know the upper class and not for people in the working classes. Okay, I want to start off then with this question about happiness: how to be happy, and also in a way how not to be depressed, or how to endure suffering, because life um, presents us with a series of hardships and setbacks, and one of the arguments in your book is that philosophy addresses this head on and helps us confront the, the, the difficulties of life. And there's a chapter entitled The Mysterious Freedom of the Stoic where you talk about this Greek school of philosophy, um, the Stoics, 
And um, I'm not sure I'm going to pronounce his, his name correctly, but but one of these philosophers, a Greek, ancient Greek philosopher, Epi, Epictetus, I think. Yeah, Epictetus, yeah. Mm -hmm. Epictetus says, he, he sums up the essence of Stoicism in one command. Do not ask things to happen as you wish, but wish them to happen as they do happen, and your life will go smoothly. So can you explain that? What does that mean? Yeah, it's, it's, it, it, it's almost the opposite of what we often think about happiness. A lot of times we think that happiness is when things go our way, that when the world sort of conforms to our expectations and hopes, then we're happy, and when it doesn't conform to our expectations and hopes, we're unhappy. The Stoics reverse that uh, and say, actually, the key is to bring your mind in accord with how things go. Rather than hope that how things go according to your mind, you want your mind to be in tune with what they call nature. Um, and uh, so they give us a whole set of practices for how to come to terms with what happens so that in a way we, it, it removes the kind of deep suffering in the world. Um, uh, uh, yes, we're still going to have pain. Yes, there's still going to be hard things that happen, but we should accept those things as, so to speak, part of the game we're playing. I, I use an analogy, um, uh, you know, it's like... Uh, if you're if you sign up for the game of football, I'm thinking of American football. Um, uh, you know you should expect to get tackled. You should expect sometimes to lose, etc. And and those things aren't really terrible things. They're certainly worth trying to avoid. But but if you sh what you should do is accept them as part of the game. You couldn't have the game of football without being tackled. You couldn't have the game of football even without getting hurt or certainly without losing. And so you, you, ha you have to kind of bring your mind in accord with that. And if you do, you can play the game well, and you play it as it should be played rather than as this kind of spoil sport. Um, and the Stoics say that's how we should treat life. We should get used to how things really go, bring our mindset in accord with them, that if we're going to, for instance, drive in a car, we should recognize, well, then that means you know it's going to get a flat tire now and again. It's, it's going to get... Uh, um, uh, uh, in an accident, perhaps, that these are all just part of the nature of the thing, and we need to, to, to accept that. Or we can choose not to accept it, and then we shouldn't do those things. Um, we, should, we should refuse to do them. But it's silly to do those things and then be upset when uh, 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 these things that are just part of the nature of the activity happen. So one of the great things about this book is it's full of little stories to try and explain what can often be quite, what a lot of people would believe, quite an abstract uh, subject. So there's a cracking story or metaphor about the fact that life is like we're like dogs leashed to a powerful chariot. When the right. chariot begins to move, we have two choices: trot or be dragged. Could you explain that metaphor? Yeah, I mean, so so the chariot in this metaphor represents what the Stoics call nature, how things go. And again, we should think of it just very practically in terms of think of the various things that we do in our lives, um, our jobs, our relationships whatever that is, though, that's the chariot. And those things are going to, 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 to uh, uh, happen regardless of how we wish them to. I give the example of a car getting stolen. In fact, it's a sort of uh, um, a funny thing as I always would give this example of a car getting stolen and how the Stokes would deal with it. And then one day after I had given this very lecture, I walked out and my car actually had been stolen. But the, but the idea is, is that that's going to happen no matter what. So then we're like the dog that's leashed to that chariot. We can either accept it or not accept it. But either way, the car remains stolen. Either way, things are going to go as they go. The only difference is, is that if we're trotting, we're not miserable, whereas if we're being dragged, we are. And so it's a kind of uh, powerful image of human life that, that we're, we're mostly like dogs who you know, are sometimes trotting happily behind the chariot, and then we want to stop, but the chariot keeps moving, and we get dragged for a while or we want it to turn left and it goes right and we get dragged for a while and then we get up and trot again. And the Stoics say, well, my advice to you all is just trot along. If it goes right, go right. If it goes left, go left. If it goes, go. If it stops, stop. And, and that is the way in which you will find a kind of true happiness. A, a lot of times people worry that this is a kind of philosophy of, of just uh, um, being inactive or, or being... Uh, uh, um, uh, too passive in relationship to your life, but actually, I, I, the funny thing is, is that when one gets in this mindset, it's it's quite activating. The Stoics themselves were not at all uh, people who just sat around and shrugged their shoulders and said, "What can I do?" They were quite active. It's just that they understood that whatever they were doing, uh, you know, they could only affect so much. But that was 
they were going to use their little bit of power to affect whatever they could and then let things go as they were. If something was truly worth doing, it was worth doing regardless of whether it was going to be successful or not. So I want to tinker with your metaphor a bit because what modern psychology would say is that if it really was the case, if we just torture the metaphor a bit, that it was really like being dogs and we had no power over the chariot, then we should learn pretty quickly that we have no power over the chariot and we should just, instead of whimpering and complaining and, and dragging, we should trot along, as you, as you put it in the book. But the reality is that sometimes we do seem to have control over the chariot. Sometimes we pull on the chariot and it, and it, it does seem to go a little bit our way. In mm -hmm. other words, there are some things in life that we can control and, and that makes us have the delusion maybe that everything is controllable. The art in life, as I think you do express elsewhere in the book, is to know what we can control but also know what we can't control. And it's that key ability to switch, it's the switch bit that's the key thing that, that maybe philosophy and psychology can give us. Yeah, no, I think that that's fine. I, 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 I mean, what the Stoics are, of course, um, somewhat in agreement with you in that they, they really do believe that that uh, you know, we do have power in some ways. We have we have kind of an amazing power for the Stoics over our own minds, and that. But the question is, we that's where we should be really directing our energies, rather than trying to to modify the world, which is is really not in our hands in any ultimate sense. We can work on our own minds, and and you're certainly right. There is a way in which sometimes what we do has an influence in the world, um, and we should use that power well. Of course, whenever we we do have that. But I do think that that's the crucial. Here's the moment of where you know reflecting on your life is very important. Is that one really does need to to accept at some level that most of what happens in life is out of our control, and we have a little sphere in which we have influence. And the real goal is to use that sphere of influence well, um, rather than to be frustrated or upset or bothered by things that really. We have no right to believe that we were, we were ever going to be able to dictate single-handedly. Okay, so now we, we move into a very difficult area, I think, for a lot of people, or a painful area, which is the fact that some of the book also is a bit about the contemplation of suicide. Mm -hmm. And I think that one of, the, one of the things at the heart of philosophy is not to avoid stuff, you know, confront right. stuff, accept the reality, however dark it might be, that life throws at us, but look at it squarely in the eye and don't run away from it. And a lot of modern life, I think you're arguing the book, is spent running away from stuff, which in the short run seems like a good answer, but in the long run is unlikely to be, again, I think you're arguing in the book. So there's this wonderful paragraph, I'm just going to read it. It says, the contemplation of suicide may seem macabre, but in truth it's just the opposite. Nothing could be more liberating than saying, today I'm not going to kill myself. I'm going to face the world in all its power. Can you ever really say yes until you realize that you can say no? So there's a sense in which philosophy says, let's confront this issue of suicide rather than trying to gloss over it. Yeah, that's right. And, um, you know, I, 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 I think about this. I, I bring up the subject of suicide in my classes periodically. And, and one of the things I've really learned, first of all, is, is that it's pretty rare to have a class where someone hasn't uh, um, encountered suicide in, in some ways in their own life, whether a loved one has committed suicide or they've contemplated it themselves. Even just just a couple weeks ago, I had a student come in and talk about how she had been contemplating suicide and chosen not to do it. And and so, you know, I, I think it's important for everyone to to come to confront this. I mean, because this this does affect us. Um, uh, and, and so I think it's worth seriously thinking about, just as you said, that we shouldn't just run away from it, but, but, but really think about it. Um, uh, you know, and of course, in philosophy, there are different answers that are given. For the most part, the philosophical traditions are opposed to, to, to suicide, but we do find, even in the Stoics, um, sometimes praise for, for people who have committed suicide under certain circumstances. But anyway, I don't, I don't presume to have all the answers there, but I certainly think that this is a great example of where not running away from something is, um, uh, uh, first of all, dignifying to us, and, and second of all, maybe, as, as, I, as you quoted from my book, maybe even empowering to us to recognize that we choose to live um, uh, perhaps puts us in a, in a more powerful relationship with regard to our own lives. But isn't this at the heart of the difference between the philosophical position and, in a way, the rest of the world. 
which is the rest of the world would really rather not look at suicide too squarely because we might come to some rather uncomfortable conclusions about whether there really is any meaning to life or any point in getting up in the morning. But philosophy says, I don't care where my search for truth takes me, even if it takes me into a very dark place, I just rather go on that journey. Right. That's right. Um, and, uh, you know, and I do try to portray in my book philosophy as a journey. Um, and it seems to me like all great journey, and it is a great journey, and like all great journeys, you have to go through a kind of dark place. Um, uh, you have to, to, to go through a kind of valley of, of shadow. Um, uh, you know, this, this comes across in all the great philosophers where, you know, they've wrestled with their demons of doubt and, and despair and meaninglessness. And, and I, don't, I don't know that you can really uh, um, come out on top unless you've, unless you've uh, uh, gone through that. But I, I also want to em emphasize that sometimes people have this feeling that that's all that philosophy is, is just kind of wallowing in some kind of meaninglessness or in skepticism. And, of course, there are some examples of that, so, so it's not completely wrong. But I think for the most part, philosophy is about, you know, coming to terms with that and then sort of saying, well, what, where do we go from here and how do, we, how do we go beyond that? In other words, that's a stage for sure, but it's not the only, the only part of, of the philosophical journey. Well, in fact, your book is very optimistic, I would say, and I want us to talk a bit about where you talk about happiness. And I'm going to read another bit. Uh, you pose the question, what is happiness? And obviously, you give many different answers at different stages in the book about that. But one answer is this. It, you say, it's the dignity of mastering the blessed gift of the mind. It's tranquility. It's an ability to bear up under the most difficult circumstances. It's a deeply satisfying sense of doing what we're supposed to be doing. Um, and the other, on the next page you say, the only person who can enslave you is you. It happens all the time. We enslave ourselves to a mug when it breaks, giving our emotions away for free to a few ounces of ceramic. We enslave ourselves to drivers who cut us off, colleagues who needle us, in-laws, random noises, late students, passing clouds, a cruel Roman. So what do you mean by this, that we enslave ourselves? Well, yeah, this is this is also in the chapter on the Stoics, and it comes out of this a, a discussion of freedom in some ways. Um, so, you know, again, we we sometimes will think of freedom as just simply being able to do whatever I want. But for for the Stoics, they give uh, 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 another account of freedom. Uh, for them, freedom is really being empowered. It is really being the author of your own life, being the author of your own actions, being in charge of things. So, for instance. You know, um, uh, uh, on one hand, you might think of freedom as just being able to eat whatever you want. So you go home and you open your refrigerator and you, you know, eat a whole tub of ice cream. Uh, for the Stoics, they'd say that's not really freedom. What freedom would be would be to set yourself a good diet and then to follow through on that. And that that would be a much more empowering, liberating thing in the long run than that momentary sense of, well, I can do whatever I want. Um, and, and, and so, you know, then this brings us to the paragraph you read where, I say we enslave ourselves to a glass when it breaks or a car when it gets stolen um, or, or these things that, that really those things shouldn't be in charge of our emotions. We should be um, in charge of them. Uh, and, and when we allow those things to dictate our emotions, we're really enslaving ourselves. We're really saying, you know, you know what, uh, a car or mug or, 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 or rude person, uh, I give you charge of, of you know, my own happiness. I'm gonna, I'm gonna sell myself out to you at least for this moment, and allow you to control what really I should be in charge of. I want to move on now to um, a large part of the book is about about whether God exists or not, and whether we can know this. And there are many different interesting takes on this, but I want to feature focus on one which is re famously referred to in the history of philosopher as Pascal's wager. Tell us a bit about who Pascal was and what his wager was. Well, Pascal was a, a absolutely a brilliant mind from the 17th century. I mean, he, he would have been well known even had he not written philosophy. He was a great mathematician and scientist and inventor. Uh, but he's probably most well known for a book of his called The Ponce, uh, which is kind of an incomplete work, though no one ever really wishes that it, he finished it. It's such a wonderful object in its own right, but it's just a bunch of jottings and notes. Uh, uh, that he had hoped at some point perhaps to work into a larger book, but that died before he could. Um, and he gives a really powerful analysis of the human condition, uh, one that perhaps resonates with even some modern-day existentialists. Some of your uh, people listening to us probably are familiar with them. 
Um, but he's also, of course, very famous for this uh, uh, kind of idea about relating to God that is called Pascal's Wager. I think that sometimes people sort of short sell it, but the basic idea is, um, he says, well, you know, if you, if you use your mind to think about does God exist or not, really the only intellectually honest answer is to say, we don't know, we have no idea, um, maybe, maybe not. And so in this sense, he compares it to someone flipping a coin and saying, call it heads or tails. Um, really, the rational answer is, how should I know? Um, uh, but he says, uh, unfortunately, or fortunately, I guess, how, depending on how you want to think of it, he says, we're committed. We have to choose. There is no agnostic option for living. Perhaps we are all agnostics in our, in our minds at some level, if we're honest with ourselves, but there's no ability to live agnostically. We either have to commit our lives to God or choose not to commit our lives to God. Um, uh, uh, it's, I, I give the example of, of a soldier in the midst of World War II trying to decide whether he should stay at home and take care of his mom or whether he should join uh, the army. And you know, the idea is he's committed. He might in his mind say to himself, well, I don't, I don't really know what the right thing to do is. Maybe the one, maybe the other. But he can't say he can't live that way. He either has to stay home or go off and fight. There is no saying, I don't know, in terms of how he lives. And that's the way we are with God, according to Pascal. And then he says, okay, so if we work from there, if we go back to my idea of a coin toss, he says, well, if it comes up heads, what if someone told you that if you called heads correctly, you win a million dollars? And what if they said if you call tails correctly, you only win the quarter? Um, which would you then choose? Well, you would surely choose heads, because even though it could just as well be tails, you don't stand much to gain by calling tails, where by calling heads, you stand to gain a million dollars. And he says the same way with God. By, by betting on God, we stand the possibility of finding a kind of meaning and contentment in our lives that we just could never find uh, uh, if we bet against God. This has partially to do with, he has a fairly bleak analysis of how human beings are inclined just to kind of run away from all their problems, a little like we were saying before. Um, and so without religion, he thinks that, that we're, we're sort of high and dry in that regard. So, so he's kind of saying that it's better to just sort of believe in God because if it is the case that God exists, then um, uh, you win the million dollars, as it were. You'll go to heaven and it'll all work out fine. But if you get it wrong, if you believe that God exists and God doesn't exist, so what? There's no big loss, really. Whereas right. the other error, which is that if you if God um, does exist and you decide to go down the route of saying he doesn't exist, you'll be in real serious trouble. So why right. take the risk? But the trouble, as you say, is it's not really appearing very authentic to just do it because you want the million, the million dollars and right. want to make an error. Rather than really, really believing in God, you're just edging your bets. Right. Though it's though it's a little bit. I mean, the, the couple responses I think that Pascal can make to that. I mean, one is is you know, if someone flips a coin and says, call it heads or tails, and you say heads, it's a little bit odd for them to then say to you, well, but do you really believe heads? You would just sort of say, look, I've called it. That's what else is there to do? I mean, I, I don't know is the answer, but I have staked my life on it or I've staked my claim on it. Um, and, and so, in a way, I think there's always got to be doubt in, in any kind of real uh, uh, honest belief. But... Uh, the other thing he, he says, the way I put it in my book, is he kind of has this view of fake it until you make it, that um, once you've kind of made this bet, ideally what should happen is, is that you should begin to go through a set of religious practices and that those practices will take root in you and you, so to speak, will start to be a real believer. He thinks that whatever we do habitually kind of becomes who we are. So if we habitually act like a believer, we will become a believer or become a kind of... Uh, theistic person. If we habitually act like uh, an atheist, then we'll become an atheist. Okay, um, let's talk a little bit about maybe quite a tricky subject, which is the contrast between Socrates and Jesus. I mean, Socrates okay. lived a few hundred years before Jesus. In a way, they end up dying in quite similar ways, you could say. There was a trial. They're both unfairly tried. Um, Socrates gets tried for, famously, the famous phrase is corrupting the youth of Athens. Um, and drink some poison. Jesus, everyone knows um, what happened to Jesus. So there's a there's a similarity. Yet there's an important contrast, which is 
philosophers like you are big fans of Socrates because in a way people believe, I think, and you must correct me if I'm wrong, the kind of philosophy begins with Socrates because he, he asks very penetrating questions. He, he, and he's full of doubt and he asks why questions. And right. famously he would tackle people in the marketplace and say, why do you believe what you believe? And obviously it got very irritating, which is why he ended up where he did in the trial thing. That's but right. Jesus, in contrast, who has many more followers than Socrates, offers you certainty. He says there is a God, you do this, you do that, you don't do the other, and you will end up in heaven or in hell. And there's a big contrast in, in terms of just general outlook in life between the two. And in a way, um, one of the reasons why Jesus is more popular than Socrates is the quest for certainty, the quest for a guide as to how to lead your life. There's a sense in which Socrates, like your book, is offering a guide on how to lead your life, but it's a, it's a more troublesome or problematic guide because it says, ask difficult questions, um, and that's the right way to go. But the trouble is it offers no more certainty beyond that. Right. That's right. And, 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 and even in my book, I mean, I try not to act as if I am coming with the answers. I, in this sense, I try to be something in the spirit of Socrates to, to be challenging and to try to kind of activate the, the process of, of examination. Um, uh, but so, so I, I agree with your characterization in that sense that philosophy is uh, 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 um, ultimately not so much about giving people the final answers in a sense of certainty and comfort, but but rather with with uh, confronting them and, and pushing them a little bit into the difficult places. But at, at the same time, I mean, I don't know that I'd want to completely. Uh, uh, Contrast Jesus and Socrates as one being cert one offering certainty and one offering doubt. Uh, you know, they both challenge us in different ways. They both, uh, you know, at least if we read the whole Platonic dialogues and look at the character of Socrates, I mean, he's he also will give people myths and and whatnot. So, th so there are lots of ways in which they could be compared. But I think overall, you're probably right that religion is going to be a much more powerful and satisfactory guide for people. Um, uh, at some level, but I, I, even there, I would worry that um, without a little philosophy in there, that it wouldn't, it, it, it becomes kind of empty, or it, it actually has the, without philosophy, I worry that religion can become uh, false or even uh, empty at some level. So, and, and even when we think about uh, historically, I mean, we know about Jesus because people wrote the Gospels about him. Well, those gospel writers were probably trained to some degree in Greek philosophy. So even even the way in which you know uh, we grasp what Christianity is all about is in some ways filtered through the influence of people like Socrates. The the other thing that I think is really interesting is the fact that philosophy ultimately I think makes people more comfortable with doubt um, in a way that the world at large um, tries. Um, to, to do away with doubt. There's, there's a wonderful discipline at the end of most academic research papers where the academic says what they don't know and right. says what they, what they could have got wrong in the paper and where the methodology might be weak, which is a wonderful exercise. You don't read that in newspapers. When newspaper editorials or newspaper articles or Fox News or CNN News covers a story like Iraq, they don't say, well, we could have got this wrong or we could have got that wrong or we don't know this or we don't know that. And while that it seems on the outside world that sort of expressing confidence and, and claiming to know is the better route. A bit of doubt, for example, over the claim that there were weapons of mass destruction in Iraq when, right. when, when people were heading down that route might actually have been a really good thing. In other words, where philosophy is really helpful is it, re it helps us reject bad ideas. It doesn't, doesn't say, well, this is definitely a good idea, but we can definitely know that's a bad idea over there, and that doubt, generally speaking, will save you from ending up making really bad decisions. And that's, for some reason, not a popular outlook today. Yeah, you're right. Um, uh, it is true, I mean, the, that we could use a lot more doubt, particularly in our talking heads and politicians and, and, and even journalists. Um, uh, and 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 really, uh, you know, I think even more than just doubt, what you're saying is that there's a kind of intellectual virtue, or just a virtue period, of being willing to to recognize one's own the limits of one's own knowledge, and even to criticize even one's most deeply held beliefs. That that's that's a real virtue, and and when people have that, it, it there's a kind of shining quality to it that I think we we recognize. But at the same time, you're certainly right that it's it's it's. Uh, 
um, uh, you know, the people who seem to get the, the, the microphone and seem to have the, the, the largest stage are those people who seem to have great confidence that they know what's going to happen if they do whatever they think is the right thing to do. So one final thing I want to put to you is that it's a wonderful book, and I agree with you completely, and people have to read the book to, to fully capture what we're trying to say about the fact that philosophy is practical and is really helpful in everyday life. But um, one issue I think you sidestep a bit in the book is that philosophy will also get you into trouble, because it <laughs> yeah. means you, you will ask very deep but troubling questions. And there's a wonderful bit in the book about a, a nurse who was a student of yours where you pose the question of what is a hospital for? And this is very relevant to me as a doctor um, where I sometimes as a psychiatrist ask things like what actually is a diagnosis? What is it for? Or what is a disease? Which actually is a very interesting question to pose to medical students because they immediately start giving you answers and of course as a philosopher you can critique those answers. Right. Um, um, and you and there's a nice interesting critique of what is actually a hospital for and by doing a bit of philosophy about asking that question you come to see where hospitals can go a bit wrong and there's a wonderful example there where if hospitals are seen as places where the sick get treated then what happens when you're pregnant you're not sick you're pregnant but they right. can treat you as if you're sick and that may not be helpful but if as a doctor or nurse you start asking those questions of your hospital managers which is what actually is the point of a hospital what are we here for you will get into trouble and, right. and the history of philosophy is philosophers getting into trouble. Um, but there's something I think you're trying to argue noble about getting into trouble. Yeah, that's right. I mean, and, and this is, um, uh, yeah, you, you're quite right. I maybe sidestepped the issue a little bit. It's certainly true that philosophy can get you into trouble because, as, as I said even at the beginning of my remarks, you know, when you examine your life, you often find that some of the dominant ideas and attitudes fall short of what's really good. And then that puts you in a, a, a tricky position because to what extent are you going to challenge them and to what extent are you just going to, to, to learn to live with them. Um, uh, and I do think that there are times when it is noble to challenge them. I think that it should always be done with great respect. I have in my chapter on Socrates, um, uh, uh, I try to wrestle with this, that he was at once willing to challenge and even break the laws of Athens in the name of what was right, but at the same time he was willing to submit to the laws of Athens out of a sense of respect for them. Um, and I do think that that's probably the balance that one needs to find. That one, In other words, I worry a little bit about people becoming tyrannical with a little bit of philosophy, thinking that, well, I've seen through all the problems and you know, in the world, and I've got all the answers now, and I should be the one in charge, and, and, and you know, I should restructure the hospital, or I should restructure politics, according to you know my 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 ingenious views. Um, I, I I worry about that kind of moment in philosophy, but at the same time, there are times when when the dominant attitudes do need to be confronted, and like I said, I think it should be done respectfully, but uh, um, in a way that uh, hopefully can bring us a little closer to something like justice or truth or happiness. Scott Samuelson, thank you very much indeed. The title of the book is The Deepest Human Life. The subtitle is An Introduction to Philosophy for Everyone. It's published by the University of Chicago Press. Scott, thank you very much indeed. Well, thank you very much. I've really enjoyed talking to you. This is the kind of thing that we philosophers like to do, is getting to chat with different types of people, and I, I really appreciate your questions. Thank you.